Hey, we're going to finish up looking at the millennial reign of Christ today, and we've been talking about that as we go along. And, um, you know, we're talking about the king is coming. That's the series. And we've looked at the two comings, and we've looked at um, the first one being private. This is rapture, and the second one being this uh, public thing that everyone sees. And we've gone through some of the millennium. Now, one of the things about John and his discussion of millennium is John simply states the fact of the millennium and the duration of it. He doesn't really get into a lot about what takes place during that, other than that these will reign with Christ for a thousand years. You really have to go to other places where Jesus mentions it some and where it's prophesied in the Old Testament um, by nearly every prophet about the kingdom. In fact, the, the book of the Bible can be said that in some sense it's about the kingdom of God. And that kingdom, that reigning, the Messiah reigning for that thousand years uh, and, and justice and, and uh, mercy and the love of God and provision of God, Israel restored, the nations coming to, to know God uh, in that time and, and serving uh, under him and the, the, the king, uh, the descendant of David that sits on that throne. And so you have to look elsewhere for that. Revelation doesn't really cover that. And so we're not looking at that either. So you go from, okay, you have the beginning of the, of the millennium of the, the reign of Christ. And then at the end of the thousand years, we saw that last time yesterday when the uh, Satan is released, he goes back to what he does. He deceives and the nations, the unbelievers rise against the rule of Jesus and then they're destroyed by fire. Today, we're looking at really the the judgments of the at the end of the millennium and so we begin in verse 10 and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever so the first thing that takes place after that final conflict is that satan is cast into hell into the lake of fire because what it was created for, for the devil and fallen angels that we call demons. That is why God created that place called hell, uh, Gehenna in Hebrew, um, and uh, here the lake of fire, the second death, this, this ongoing eternal isolation from God, separation from God. It is not temporary. It's not um, it is a place of torment, it is a place of agony, and that's where the devil ends up, and that's what it was created for. Uh, the beast and the false prophet are still there and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it's not ending. It's a horrible thing to think about, being tormented, being isolated from God, being separated from the love, the goodness, the mercy, the grace of God, all of that, and just being in torment uh, for eternity. And, um, and not only is Satan there, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. From, whom, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Now, the, the debate about who is sitting on the great white throne, is it God the Father or is it the Son, Jesus? I tend to lean toward it being the Son, Jesus, because Scripture says that judgment is given to him. Jesus, in fact, said that, uh, that judgment had been given to him, that he would judge. The Father judges no one. The judgment is given to him. And so I think that, that Jesus Christ is going to be on that great white throne and, and will be doing the judgment. Now, another interesting thing is that it says that uh, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Now, that is just an, a quick sentence about the new creation, the new heavens and new earth that are going to be done. And of course, that's reasonable because this earth has been contaminated by sin and death. All of nature uh, is an agony wanting to be released from the bondage of sin and death that they have not participated in. They've been, as Paul says in Romans, that the subhuman created order has been subject to decay and contamination, not through any fault of its own, but because of our sin. And so he says that not only do we groan and agonize waiting for our perfection, but so does all of creation waiting for our perfection. I think even the angelic beings are longing for our perfection so that things will be put right and things finally will be as God intended them to be all along. Now, I, I don't know what the new heaven and earth will look like. No one does, doesn't say. It just says that there will be. This old one is going to be done away with. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And, and we're going to get to see it and get to explore it and get to experience it. I look forward to that. It's going to be an awesome, awesome thing. So you have that. Uh, that's going to be done. 
And I saw the dead, the great and the small, that's social economic conditions, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, books plural. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, a couple of things. Death and Hades. What is Hades? Well, Hades is that temporary place. Hades matches uh, Sheol in Hebrew. It's the place of the dead. The, the righteous dead, the believing dead, uh, Christ emptied out that part of Hades, uh, the blessed place of the dead, the bosom of Abraham, as it's called, paradise, whatever it might be. That was emptied by Christ after his death, and he led them to heaven. They are there now. And the wicked dead still in Hades, that's going to be emptied out here at this point. So those wicked dead are resurrected, brought to life to stand for judgment. Uh, and this is a judgment scene. There's no doubt about it. They're standing, waiting for sentence to be delivered. That's why there's pictured as standing. Um, there's no, no court. There's going to be no testimony given. The only testimony, here's the evidence, the books that are brought out. And one of them is the deeds that are done. I think probably good deeds and evil deeds and, uh, or godless deeds. And then the most important one is the book of life, that these are the basis of the judgment that is made. Um, I think there are de degrees of punishment in the place called hell. There are levels, I think, and it's based on your deeds. Well, this is a higher level, that's a lower level, but it's still the lake of fire, and that's based on one thing and one thing only, whether you go into the lake of fire or not. And it is a permanent, terrible place, and I don't want anyone to go there. And this is probably one of the saddest things you can read in Scripture. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So in spite of, deeds don't matter. It's really not the deeds that matter. What matters is, is your name in the book of life or not? Now, I, there are two ways you can take the book of life. One is, everyone that gets saved gets their name written in the book of life. The other way of taking it is, everyone who is born, everyone, I should say, everyone who is conceived, its name is in the book of life. And I don't know whether that's Rick Roberts that's written there or whether it's the name that I don't know yet that only Jesus knows that is the essence of me, my real name. Maybe that's what's written there. So either you're saved and your name is written there or everyone that's born or conceived, since I believe life begins at conception, is written down. Those who do not receive Jesus Christ, their names are erased. And one of the saddest pictures you can imagine is, here are these names in the book of life. And they go down, there's this one, this one, and there's a space, there's a space, there's a space. And there's some more names, there's a space, there's some more names, there's two or three more spaces. There are spaces there where names were blotted out, erased from the book because they never received the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is a sad, sad picture to look at and say, I could have been. My name could have been there, but it wasn't. No one is going to stand before God and say, I didn't know. No one is going to stand before God and say, I didn't have a chance. No one's going to stand before God in that respect. This final punishment, this final judgment and sentence carried out is done complete righteousness and holiness, goodness, and it must be this way. And I know we don't like to think about it. We don't like to think about hell. We don't like to think about people's names being erased from the book. We don't like to think about people going to hell. We don't like to think about that. We like to think that it's all going to be okay in the end. But that's thinking in terms of if you reject the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the only salvation that there is is in Jesus Christ, if you reject that and say, no, I don't need that, I'll go on my own, then you are still in rebellion against God, and God will not tolerate, cannot tolerate anything in rebellion against him. Anything that is, has the taint of sin and death, that contamination, cannot be in the presence of a holy God. 
And so he has done everything that can be done to rescue his creation. But it's a free will choice. We can, we can reject or receive the grace of God, the mercy of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, uh, God's love is so great that he will allow you to choose the other rather than his grace. He will allow that. But the consequence of that is, if you choose that, then there is separation. You say, well, what about somebody, they got killed in a car accident, and they were thinking about getting saved, but they didn't get saved. Well, not making a decision is making a decision as well. And there's really no way around it that the, the love of God is on display, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, the holiness of God. All of that is in display. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But there is a consequence to rejecting that love of God. And the consequence is eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, which always means separation. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is an option. And God doesn't send anyone to hell. They are standing for the judgment that's already been done by the choices made. And if your name is not, ultimately, it's not the deeds, good or bad. It's your name not being written in the book of life. That is the book that determines eternity. Whether you will be in heaven or the new earth, because heaven is a temporary place as well, be a new creation that's gonna be talked about. And we'll talk about that next time, uh, talk about the new creation. We'll wind down the whole He is Coming series, The King is Coming. But you have to talk about this, and I'm sorry, that's just how it is. And it's not a pleasant subject. The point is, make sure your name's written in the book of life. Receive the mercy, grace, and love of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Be rescued out of this. Because God is holding out his arms. Christ Jesus died for you so that you could be rescued, so that you could be declared innocent. You could be declared in the right because you're in Christ Jesus. You've been moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You've been moved from being under Adam to being under Christ. You're in him if you've received Jesus Christ, trusted in the finished work of Christ by faith. I pray that you have. I pray that you know that. I want your name to be in the book of life. I want to see you there. I think that would be one of the greatest privileges to get to see you, to get to know you. All right. Listen, that's winding that up. We're going to do the, finish that up uh, Sunday morning. We're going to talk about the millennium, and we'll add some stuff to it about what the millennium is like and that kind of thing. We won't just limit it to what John says in Revelation, but I, I'll at least point that out. If you don't have a church home, we would love to worship with you at Troy First Baptist Church. Hey, listen, this Sunday we're starting. It will be our Sunday school and small group fellowships will be at 9 o'clock. And then we start worship at 10.15. So 9 o'clock to 10 is our small group. And then from 10.15, uh, we'll, have, we'll have worship. So looking forward, if you don't have a church home, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to see you. Uh, and if not, I'll see you Monday. And we start talking about the new creation. The new creation God has that we get to be a part of. How awesome is that? Well, listen, I pray you know the love of God in Christ Jesus because God loves you so much. He gave his only begotten son. You might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that that's yours because if it is, if Christ Jesus is yours, not only are those three things yours, but the peace of God that surpasses understanding is yours as well. I pray that you know that shalom of God. Until we see each other again, either through this lens or in person, I pray God's shalom rest upon you always. See you next time.